Hi everyone. Um, this PowerPoint is to try and help you revise the First World War and specifically what we're going to look at today is part one, which is the causes of the First World War. So I've put on the screen in front of you, you should be able to see our specification here for the different things that we need to know for this aspect of the course. And this PowerPoint will take you over all of these and this slide again appears towards the end. So by all means, kind of pause it if you need to at any point so that you can look at these in more depth. OK, so the first thing for us to look at is the alliances that exist in Europe in 1914. And sometimes instead we use the phrase armed camps rather than alliances, because as we'll see, some of these aren't true alliance agreements. So the first thing is to take a moment and see if you can even remember the names of the agreements that form these armed camps. I'll give you a moment, see if you can think of anything. You should hopefully have come up with, first of all, the Triple Alliance, which you can see in the red there on the map. The Triple Alliance consisted of Germany, uh, Germany Austria-Hungary and Italy, and this was signed in 1882. This alliance had been initiated by Germany because they were very afraid that the French would attack them as repercussions for the Franco-Prussian War. So as a result, they had gathered some allies together in case they faced attack. The Franco-Russian Agreement is then signed in 1893. Again, this is all part of that aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War. France feared further German attacks in the future, and therefore this was a culmination of a long-standing French policy to try to develop a, uh, an ally on the other side of Germany, thus putting Germany in a very difficult position should war break out. So this was signed in 1893. The final two agreements that we have concern Britain, and you can see the image that's just appeared on the screen showing Britain's kind of a bit detached at this time. This is because Britain was just emerging from splendid isolation. Britain for many years have been perfectly happy to not really have very much involvement in Europe as long as no single power became too strong. They instead want to just focus on their empire. The agreements that are signed the two bottom blue bullet points uh, therefore show them drawing closer to other countries but they stop short of forming a proper alliance where they will agree to actually fight with another country should a war break out. So the Entente Cordiale that signed in 1903-1904, this is Britain's agreement with France, but it concerns reforms in the colonies and was essentially further to them carving up bits of North Africa between them. France agreed that it wouldn't object to Britain making reforms in Egypt and Britain agreed that France would continue to have increased influence over Morocco. The Anglo-Russian agreement is very similar and can take, uh, was between England and Russia this time, Britain and Russia this time, and concerned uh, reforms such as Britain's reforms in Persia. But it does show them drawing closer to these other European countries, even though they're not strict alliance agreements. German foreign policy is seen as one of the reasons for this war breaking out. And there are two key phrases that we associate with German foreign policy at this time. The first one of these is Weltpolitik. This translated as world policy, and it meant that the Kaiser wanted to be treated as if Germany is important in world affairs. We'll see them enact this policy in places like Morocco later on. The other policy is a place in the sun. The Kaiser wanted to develop his own empire, and this caused lots of tensions, especially with countries like Britain leading up to the First World War. There are then several crises that we study that bring this war even closer. The first of these concerns Morocco. Now, we just met, mentioned Morocco when it came to those uh, agreements that took place between the major powers before the First World War. The Moroccan crisis in 1905 concerned this French influence over Morocco and Germany's desire to challenge this. So this began when Germany opposed the French attempts to control Morocco. In 1905, Kaiser Wilhelm went to Tangier, parading through the streets on a white horse, stating that he would support Morocco as an independent country. Note that bit really carefully. This is a very common error that I see where people start saying, oh, Germany, what in Morocco is part of its empire? The Kaiser realised he's not going to be able to achieve this, but he does want Weltpolitik to happen. So he believes that Germany should be consulted, and this is him getting involved in international relations as a result. And he wants to support Morocco as an independent country, he called for an international conference on the issue. This conference was held at Algeciras in southern Spain in January 1906, and this totally backfires on the Germans. At the conference, 
only Austria-Hungary supports um, Germany, along with Morocco themselves. France was technically forced to recognise Moroccan independence in that Morocco retained its own sultan and therefore has its own independent ruler. But they are really in practice given far more extensive control over Morocco. They get control over the Moroccan bank, the customs and excise system, controlling the goods going in and out of the country, arms supply and even the Moroccan police force. So in reality, the French end up gaining increased control and this has really backfired on Germany. And this crisis leaves important after effects. Britain now began secret military talks with France. Again, don't take this too far. We don't sign a proper alliance agreement with them. But France is increasingly becoming more confident of British support at this time. I suppose increasingly we have more in common with the French and that we are both increasingly concerned about this potential threat from Germany. Britain began to also take more of an interest in European affairs. An Anglo-Russian agreement that we mentioned right at the start was signed just a year later, showing how these three Entente powers really drew together over this crisis. The Bosnian crisis is our next important crisis in 1901. You can see the arrow on the screen pointing to Bosnia. Now you'll notice that Bosnia on the map is in the same colour as the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And you see the label for the Austro-Hungarian Empire just extends totally over the image of Bosnia that we've got there. And that's because this is what happens in the Bosnian crisis, isn't it? This is Bosnia uh, being annexed by Austria-Hungary. So this was all part of the continuing impact of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire has long been known as the sick man of Europe. It had once extended all the way really up to Austrian territory, but increasingly the Ottoman Empire was weak and it was collapsing. And in its wake, other countries were trying to gain independence and other great powers were trying to seize some of the countries that had once been under Ottoman control. Serbia, which is on our map here, you can see it in the pink next to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was one of um, was the leading Slav state at this time, and it wanted to unite the other Slavic states under Serbian leadership. Austria-Hungary was very concerned about this. You might remember that Austria-Hungary was made up of lots of different uh, ethnic groups. It was a multi-ethnic empire, as well as obviously people of Austrian background and Hungarian background. Uh, there were Serbs living there, hence Serbia's uh, concern. There was Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, all people which nowadays were recognised as having independent countries within Europe. Austria-Hungary was very concerned that if Serbia managed to unite other Slavic states around it, then nothing was there to stop other nationalities, other countries that made up part of Austria-Hungary from also seeking the same. So Austria-Hungary wanted to control Serbia as a way of controlling nationalism within its own empire, making sure that other bits of the Austro-Hungarian Empire didn't want to break away as well. So in 1908, Austria annexed Bosnia, and Bosnia was mostly Slavic. So this made the Serbs very angry. They believed that they should be taking over Bosnia and uniting with them, if anyone. Serbia now appealed to the Russians for help. Russians were also of a similar ethnic background, and they believed that the Russians would help them. A conference was held, and at this conference, Germany decided to support Austria-Hungary. In some ways, this was quite surprising because Germany weren't best pleased with Austria-Hungary about this crisis. The Austro-Hungarians hadn't consulted the Germans before they'd taken any action, and Germany didn't necessarily support what Austria-Hungary had done here in Bosnia. But this is where we start seeing a pattern and emerging. You will remember that in Morocco, Austria had been the only one of the great powers to support Germany. And Germany now felt that it really had to repay that favour or leave themselves in danger of having no allies whatsoever. Russia was therefore forced to back down. We know that Britain and France are aligned with Russia at this time, but they weren't really interested in becoming involved in events way over in Eastern Europe that they saw as being no, of re no real concern to them. But this crisis has massive effects. Austria-Hungary became increasingly confident of German support. Really, when we get to 1914, I know you're all very familiar with the details of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. I always say to my classes that 1914 is really an exact repeat of what happens in 1908 in terms of the effects and the patterns that are set in place. After 1908, Austria is very confident of German support. And in 1914, of course, Germany will come through and support Austria-Hungary when the assassination happens. 
Italy disapproves of these events and they continued their pattern of distancing themselves from the Triple Alliance. You'll remember that Italy hadn't supported Austria and Germany over Morocco either. Russia was humiliated and this again has long term effects because Russia began to make military improvements now, preparing themselves for war. Britain, France and Russia drew closer. This might be surprising because, of course, Britain and France hadn't supported Russia over this. But they are increasingly united by a dislike of Germany and a fear of Germany's intervention in European affairs. Serbia reluctantly accepted Bosnia's annexation. In the past, they've sometimes put sources on the exam paper showing Serbia accepting Bosnia's annexation in 1908. But really, they had no other choice at that time. And they did become even more determined to oppose Austria in the future, which, of course, is going to lead us to the assassination. And conditions in the Balkans, this area of southeastern Europe, will later provide this spark for the First World War beginning. The second Moroccan crisis in 1911 again nudges us further forward towards war. In 1911, there were risings against the Sultan of Morocco, the ruler of Morocco, and he requested that the French come and help him to restore order. So the French uh, sent an army along. Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany now fears that the French are going to gain an advantage here and that they will annex Morocco, take it over. And therefore, he sends a gunboat to Agadir. Now, again, be careful here. I see errors with this crisis quite often. Kaiser Wilhelm doesn't think that he can get Morocco for himself. This is not necessarily what he's up to here. Instead, he wants to get involved so he can use this as a bargaining chip. He essentially hopes that what will eventually happen is that there will be a conference over this and they will have to say to him, well, we want you to remove your gunboat from Agadir, this Moroccan port, and we will give you they hope that what they will get in return for this is the French Congo. So they've become involved, but it's not to gain Morocco itself. It is a bargaining chip. So later on, they can be part of the conversation and hopefully get the French Congo out of this. Now, this has further effects. The gunboat massively angers the British. It comes particularly too close as far as Britain are concerned, to our important naval base at Gibraltar. And Lloyd George, who's the Chancellor of the Exchequer at this time, makes his Mansion House speech threatening Germany really with war, saying that if this is the price of peace to kind of be insulted in this way, then they're not interested in maintaining peace. Germany demands an apology for this because it's so provocative, but they don't receive one. And we can see how serious things are now getting because preparations for war are made in Germany, Britain and France. However, as with our other crises, a conference now resolves the issue. Now, Germany does get two strips of land in the Congo, but don't overstate this. Germany haven't got what they wanted. This was seen as an insult to Germany because they hadn't received the whole thing. And the land that they do receive wasn't seen as being particularly useful. It was very marshy, boggy land. So they couldn't use it for very much. Um, it didn't have great raw materials there or anything like that. So this was seen as an insult to Germany. And in return, they had to accept French control over Morocco. Now, the results of this crisis are very significant. Germany was humiliated by this. And Germany would now be unlikely to back down again. Public opinion particularly becomes extremely anti-British because of Lloyd George's Mansion House speech. Britain now became convinced that Germany wanted to dominate Europe, so also was becoming, again, further concerned about what Germany was up to here. Britain and France now reached a secret naval agreement, and this agreement said that if war broke out, Britain would defend the northern coast of France and Europe, and France would defend the Mediterranean. So you can see them here embark on some co-planning for what they will do if war breaks out. You can perhaps see some uh, areas that Britain's particularly concerned here. This issue of the northern coast of France and Belgium will, of course, be an issue later on as well when Britain decides to join the war. Italy, again, opposes Germany and Germany is now really totally reliant on Austria-Hungary as their only consistent, reliable ally. Again, this will have an effect when we get to 1914. In the background to all of this, the naval and arms race have been going on. This was started by Britain launching the Dreadnought in 1906. The Dreadnought was the most advanced warship ever seen up to this point. It had very thick armour plating, so it was very difficult to attack. It had very high calibre guns, so it could fight other ships um, quite easily. And had better engines as well. It was faster than many warships that had existed up to this point. 
This is a positive for Britain because they are the first to this new technology, but British public opinion quickly becomes alarmed because Germany now begins to produce their own version of these battleships. These battleships take a long time to build, so you see we only plan to build four in 1909, and people are concerned about this. There are pressure groups who use the slogan, we want eight and we won't wait. Agadir further raised British fears because after this Agadir crisis, the second Moroccan crisis that we've just been talking about in 1911, 1911, there were further concerns about possibility of war. But after 1911, the race did become less intense because Britain pulls further ahead. By 1914, Britain had 29 dreadnoughts, Germany had 17, would really comfortably won the naval race that went on at this time. Therefore, I always think it's quite a nice one if, they, if this comes up in any form in your exam, because while it did increase that tension between Britain and Germany, it's not really a direct cause of the war, is it? If we're saying that the worst of this is over by 1911, it's obviously not necessarily the most fundamental reason why war is going to break out three years after that. But it does add to this pattern of Britain and Germany dislike for each other in this period and tensions between them. So now we're going to look at the final steps to war breaking out in 1914. And you guys, I'm sure listening, already know what's going to cause the outbreak of war in 1914. It's going to be the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. We're going to set the background to this again, though. Remember how the Bosnian crisis of 1908 had led the kind of foundations for this. Austria had annexed Bosnia in 1908. Serbia had been very angry. Russia had developed her armed forces as a result of this. And in the intervening years, Serbia had become increasingly strong as well. They had particularly been triumphant in two wars, the Balkan Wars um, uh, between 1912 and 1913, and they'd begun to really expand their territory. Serbia continued to have this ambition of wanting to create a greater Serbia, and the next objective for them was Bosnia. In 1911, therefore, 10 men formed the Black Hand movement within Serbia, wanting to unite all the Serbs, these people of this similar Slavic race, and forming this greater, uh, greater Serbia. By 1914, this group has 2,500 members, and of course, they will conduct this assassination at Sarajevo in 1914. So the assassination happened when Franz Ferdinand, who was heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, he was next in line to the throne. He visited Sarajevo on the 28th of June to, uh, 1914 to witness a display of army manoeuvres. Now, he had been warned against visiting because this was also a Serbian national festival day and he'd been warned that tensions were likely to be running high. Security was quite poor. There was only 120 police to cover the route that he goes on. And he also insists in travelling in an open topped car because he wanted to present a kind of open image to the people of this region. The first attempt on the Franz Ferdinand's life takes place when Kabrinovich throws a grenade at the car. But you probably remember that it bounces off the back of the car and explodes without causing um, any uh, any damage to Franz, Ferdinand, uh, to Franz Ferdinand. Franz Ferdinand now reaches the town hall and he decided to abandon the tour after visiting the people who had been wounded in the in the first assassination attempt. Um, yeah, he decided, sorry, he decided to abandon the tour after visiting the wounded, people who had been wounded that morning in the attempt on his life. However, fatally, his driver was not told about this change in route. As Franz Ferdinand is now driving through the streets of Sarajevo, Gavrilo Princip is there. Franz Ferdinand's driver takes a wrong turn. He ends up just by chance on the same street as Gavrilo Princip. Princip fires those two shots, killing Franz Ferdinand and his wife. The consequences of this, well, to begin with, people don't think this is going to be uh, the big problem that it later becomes. Obviously, it sounds like a shocking event, and it was, but it was not uncommon uh, royal assassinations within this period. Several czars of Russia have been assassinated, other members of the Austro-Hungarian royal family have been assassinated previously. Certainly, initially, no one foresees that this is going to lead to a massive war breaking out. But it is seen critically by some in Austria as a chance to finally deal with Serbia, this worrying state right on its borders that's causing perhaps nationalist tensions to rise within Austria-Hungary itself. The Austrians send a 10-point ultimatum to Serbia and they accept all of the points on this ultimatum but one. Serbia thinks therefore that this is likely to lead to further negotiation. 
But Austria-Hungary, now assured of German support, declares war on Serbia on the 28th of July 1914. Some alliances were now triggered by these events, so this is going to trigger some of our alliance system. Russia began to mobilise against Austria-Hungary and Germany. This is where you really see, as I've said previously, it being a repeat of what goes on in 1908. Russia hadn't been able to support Serbia over the Bosnian crisis in 1908. But remember what we've said, Russia strengthened in the years up to 1914. Now they don't want to be humiliated again. They're determined to support Serbia over this matter. And they begin to mobilise against Austria-Hungary and Germany on the 30th of July. Germany declared war on Russia on the 1st of August after they didn't respond to an ultimatum to stop mobilising. But at this point, war was contained to Eastern Europe. What's going to spread the war to the West is the Schlieffen Plan. So after the signing of the Franco-Russian alliance in 1893, Germany, as we know, had been concerned with this problem of a war on two fronts. Sometimes this term encirclement is used. They felt that they were encircled by their enemies. In 1905, von Schlieffen had proposed a solution, and the solution had been that they would attack France, advancing through Belgium to try and make the attack quicker and take the French by surprise, and also avoid the very heavily defended Franco-German border. This would defeat France within six weeks, and they would then turn around and defeat the Russians on the other border. They were gambling on the fact that they thought Russia would take a long time to mobilise for this war. This was now going to spread war to the West because Russian mobilization put the Schlieffen plan in jeopardy because, of course, the Germans had planned to fight the French first. The quicker the Russians continued to mobilize, the more the Schlieffen plan was beginning to, to be in danger. Germany demanded neutrality from France. So to try and get themselves out of this problem, the Germans sent an ultimatum to France asking them to remain neutral in this war. The French ignore this and the Germans now declare war on the 3rd of August. Britain was primarily concerned of the security of the northern European coast. Remember that agreement they'd signed at the end of the second Moroccan crisis. Germany now invaded Belgium on the 3rd of August and Britain declared war on the 4th. Britain claimed, of course, that it was going to war over the sanctity of treaties, the Treaty of London that it signed in 1839, saying that they will preserve the neutrality of Belgium. And they put this on all the propaganda posters as to why they've gone to war in 1914. So this leads us to the war having broken out. We've looked at the events that lead us up to war, as you can see here. So we've looked at the alliance system. We've looked at Anglo-German rivalry and some of the events that happen there. And we've looked at this final outbreak of war. I would suggest your next steps of Eurovision. Well, there are two more videos to watch that take us through World War I um, as a whole. So there are two more videos to watch in this World War I sequence. Of course, I'd advise that you rewatch this video as many times as you need to. Um, you can also follow this up by using your revision guide. Many of you, most of you have revision guides. There are activities there. So if it's a lot of information to take in, there are activities to try and break this down. You've, of course, got your printed notes as well on this topic. Um, there are full and simplified versions if you find those easier. But then try and develop this on further as well. One of the least effective ways to revise is just by reading and reading and reading things until, until you're fed up of it. I would advise perhaps to make your own revision notes on this. I see lots of people do this. Use in like little index cards, those little small cards. So for instance, you could make your own kind of cards on Morocco and Bosnia and the second Moroccan crisis, for instance, and you can use these to test yourself or get someone else to test you. Look at past paper questions as well. These are available on the AQA website. Email your class teacher if you can't find the, the link to these. Uh, practice these, or if you don't fancy doing the whole paper, then even kind of bullet point, mind map your answers. That would be a great way to develop this. So. Thank you for listening to this video. I hope it was helpful to you. Remember, there's two more in this World War One sequence and good luck for your exams. Thank you.